Welcome to a very special global launch of the 2024 World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. This year we're celebrating 15 years since the World Justice Project was established as an independent, nonpartisan, multidisciplinary organization. From the beginning, our mission has been to advance the rule of law around the world, and the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index is a critical tool in this work. Today, the index is used by the United Nations, the World Bank, and development agencies around the world to assess rule of law strengths and weaknesses and to inform program design. It's used by national governments to identify deficiencies, drive reforms, and benchmark progress. It's used by international businesses and investors to assess risk and opportunity. And it's used by global and local civil society organizations to advocate for human rights, accountability, and people-centered justice. Today, you'll learn what the 2024 World Justice Project Rule of Law Index tells us about the current state of authoritarian trends, corruption, justice systems, and fundamental freedoms around the world. You'll hear where the challenges lie, but also what's working to address them. You'll also hear directly from countries that made notable rule of law progress this year, and you will learn how they did it. Our executive director, Elizabeth Anderson, will guide you through the program, but first, Here's a short video that explains the evolution of the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. Why do some communities thrive while others struggle? This question inspired the creation of the World Justice Project and an audacious idea that's changing the world. What if the most critical thing a community needs isn't wealth, health, or education, but the invisible foundation that makes all of that possible, the rule of law? We decided to test our idea and do something that had never been done. We set out to measure the rule of law and how well it protects people from abuse of power, corruption, and injustices, big and small. From surveying thousands of experts and citizens in a handful of countries 15 years ago, we've expanded each year. Today, the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index covers over 140 countries and 95% of the world's people. Now the whole world can see what our research makes clear. Where rule of law is stronger, so is the economy, education, health, and peace. Because the rule of law is the best way to ensure fair and just communities where everyone can thrive. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Anderson, Executive Director of the World Justice Project, and I'm excited to join you live from our Washington DC headquarters to reveal the brand new findings from our 2024 WJP Rule of Law Index. Thank you for joining us from so many parts of the world. Good morning, De Fernando in Chile and all those watching from Latin America and the Caribbean. And good afternoon to those of you joining us from Europe, the Middle East and Africa. And good evening to everyone in the Asia Pacific region. Thanks too for all the comments. Keep those coming. In fact, I'd like to ask you to weigh in right now. Today, we'll update you on major challenges to the rule of law around the world. But we'll also recognize that reversing negative trends is possible and that progress is underway right now. So let me ask everyone watching, which country do you think made the biggest rule of law improvement in the WJP index this year? Please put your answer in the comments now and later on we'll have the big reveal and I'll speak to someone personally involved in making that change happen. But first, let's dig in to the 2024 WJP rule of law index data.
I'm joined now by Alicia Evangelidis, the director of the WJP Rule of Law Index. Alicia, welcome. This is a big day for you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It is great to be here. Um, and yes, our team has been working really hard for months now to gather data from 142 countries and jurisdictions. We've collected surveys from over 200,000 everyday people and experts around the world, which is a lot of data. And we are very excited to share what we've learned today. Well, great. Let's just dive in then. Let's do it. Here you see our new map showing relative strengths and weaknesses in the rule of law around the world. The dark green represents countries with the strongest rule of law, while the red represents the weakest. Once again, the top country in this year's index is Denmark. No new countries joined the top 10 this year, but we did see a little movement. New Zealand made notable progress and moved up two positions, while Ireland also improved its score and moved up one position. The bottom performers in this year's index stayed largely the same, and Venezuela remains in the final position. However, one new country did move into the bottom 10 this year, which was Sudan. Mauritania, on the other hand, made some rule of law progress and actually moved out of the bottom 10. Okay, got it. So what are the major trends that you're seeing in the data this year? Well, unfortunately, the global rule of law recession is continuing this year. The rule of law declined in a majority of countries for the seventh year in a row. This year, 57% of countries saw their rule of law scores decline. This map here shows relative changes in the past year, with the darker pink and red showing the biggest declines and blue showing improvement since last year. And what's driving the rule of law declines globally? Well, our index looks at eight different factors of the rule of law, and the biggest drivers of the declines this year are the two factors that relate to rising authoritarianism. So in 2024, constraints on government powers and fundamental rights both declined globally, and they did so even more than they did last year. Civil justice problems are also driving declines, but to a lesser extent than last year. Okay, so break that down for us some more. What do these declines mean for people and governments around the world? In the case of fundamental rights, declines are affecting people in 63% of countries this year. Our data shows that things like freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and privacy rights have all receded, and discrimination has gotten worse in a majority of countries. Then at the same time, constraints on government powers declined in 59% of countries this year. In other words, governments are getting more powerful and less accountable. That's exactly right, Betsy. Um, executive power in particular is really on the rise. The capacity of legislatures, courts, the media, and civil society to limit that executive power really continues to shrink globally. When it comes to civil justice, declines occurred in 56% of countries, which is significantly less than last year, so that's great. Um, but this year, access to and affordability of justice actually improved in a majority of countries, so we were happy to see that. But justice delays and weak enforcement are getting worse, so there was a net decline. Interesting. So it's really a mixed bag when it comes to advancing people-centered justice around the world. Uh, are there any positive developments that you're seeing in the data this year? Yes, we have a few actually. Uh, first of all, even though the rule of law got weaker in a majority of countries for the seventh year in a row, the declines are slowing down a bit. So that's great. The red line in this graph shows the percentage of countries where the rule of law declined each year. So you can see that the declines really spiked during the first year of the pandemic, but since then, a smaller share of countries have declined each year. Another positive sign relates to the fight against corruption. For the first time in five years, a majority of countries actually improved on our factor measuring the absence of corruption. So in 59% of countries, people see their governments as less corrupt this year. And finally, criminal justice improved in a majority of countries this year as well, or 54% of them. Okay, Alicia, in a minute, we're going to hear about some specific examples of what's working to improve the rule of law. But yeah. first, put all of this in context for us. Tell us about the longer term rule of law trends that we're facing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the rule of law recession has affected people all over the world, in all regions, all economic groups. Our research shows that at least 6.3 billion people live in countries where the rule of law has declined since 2016. The biggest drivers of this recession really relate to two global trends. 
The first is that justice systems are failing to meet people's needs, although we are starting to see some improvement there. And the second is rising authoritarianism. Unfortunately, this trend did accelerate this year. Thank you, Alicia. We're going to talk to leaders pushing back on those trends in a minute. But first, one more question. People have been calling 2024 the year of the election with record yeah. number of folks uh, going to the polls this year. What does that mean for the rule of law? Does that suggest that there's maybe change around the corner? Well, maybe in some countries, but unfortunately, as the rule of law has weakened globally, so have electoral systems. Our index subfactor measuring law, lawful transition of power, excuse me, has declined in about 72% of countries since the global rule of law recession began. That's concerning, especially when elections are such a critical way that citizens can push back on authoritarian trends, check government powers, and really uh, reverse the rule of law recession. Yeah. So on that note, let's find out which country improved the most on this year's index. Let's see first, what did, uh, what did folks predict in the comments? It looks like Robert guessed Canada and Grace put in a vote for Kenya. Let's see, did anyone say Poland? Because actually the most improved country this year is Poland. Poland is followed by Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Brazil. Well, thank you, Alicia. That's a good way to wrap up our key findings. These countries are demonstrating that rule of law progress is possible. To see if your country improved this year, explore our interactive website. And as you do that, I wanna to turn to some countries making important progress. Earlier, I spoke with two leaders to hear what's working in their countries right now. Let's start by taking a closer look at Poland. In recent years, Poland had some of the world's biggest rule of law declines, but now the tide is turning and this year's index captures major advances in open government and checks on executive power. To find out how Poland became this year's top rule of law performer, I spoke with Sylvia Grigorczyk Abram of the Free Courts Foundation, one of the finalists in WJP's 2024 World Justice Challenge. If what you hear from Sylvia resonates with you, please tell us why in the chat. Sylvia, help us understand this progress. What reforms has Poland undertaken? to rebuild its democratic institutions and uh, achieve this impressive rule of law reversal. Of course, let me just uh, start with a brief explanation what happened uh, since 2016 until 2033, uh, southern elections in Poland in which the democratic uh, parties has uh, have won. Uh, the whole justice system was basically hijacked by the politicians. They changed the, um, the rules uh, in a way that the politicians had control over the, over the courts and took over control of the constitutional tribunal. So the regular citizen didn't have a right to the independent court once having, having regular case in, in the court. And there were several changes regarding mostly in the, um, the process of appointing the judges. They changed the way of appointing the judges and politicians, not judges, were doing that. So they, they, the, the change was huge for, for, uh, uh, for each of us. And now, since the elections is almost uh, a year now, uh, the new government is doing all the actions that may in the future or now restore the justice system and give it back to the citizens and give it back to the democratic values and mostly to the value of the free independent court. And to do that, uh, the Ministry of Justice and the government, they already um, introduced several changes to the law that are touching the most fragile um, aspects of the uh, justice system and the most important uh, uh, institutions uh, from the citizens' perspective. 
So they already introduced the law on National Judiciary Council, so the inst uh, institution that appoints and promotes the judges, very important one. Uh, the government has proposed that this institution will be independent again, not uh, dependent on the politicians. And uh, the Constitutional Tribunal, which was completely took over from the, uh, of the, by the politicians, and they put on the table two very complex acts that may reverse the situation and again give the tribunal back to the citizens that it will perform its crucial role to defend the citizens from the power and from any infringement of the of the rights citizens rights and, and human uh, rights and you know other several acts regarding you know regarding the, the functioning of the justice system but the problem uh, is now that the those changes should be introduced to the law by the act and legislative process. It's uh, constructed in a way that it goes through parliament and then at the very end, the president has to sign it. And we don't have a democratic president. He was very much cooperating with the previous government. He is from the previous um, um, uh, and justice party that used to govern uh, in Poland. So he's not willing to help the government and the Ministry of Justice to actually reverse these changes is he, and he's blocking those changes, either veto them or sending them to this political constitutional tribunal. So we are in a bit uh, difficult situation once the changes wants to be done, but cannot be fully done because of the complexity of the legislative process that includes the presidents at the very end of the process. I see. Very interesting. Well, restoring the rule of law, as we're seeing happen in Poland, of course, requires government action, but also um, action by others. Um, it's really a whole of society effort involving the legislature, the judiciary, also civil society organizations like the Free Courts Foundation. So tell us a little bit about how those different actors have contributed um, to defending the rule of law in the earlier period and now uh, fostering this progress. Well, I strongly believe that the civil society had a crucial role um, uh, in restoring the, the democratic values in Poland. We are still in this process, but the civil society was a crucial actor in this uh, process of stopping the changes of the destruction of the justice system or at least limiting them together with also with the politicians of the then opposition parties. That was a combination of joint uh, efforts and we as a foundation and we as a, a lot of other NGOs has, has devoted their own life and time to um, stop this destruction of, of uh, rule of law in various ways. We had several, over a hundred proceedings bef before the, the European tribunals and we got we obtained a judgment with those cases that they are now a roadmap for the government to reverse the destruction of justice system. We have organized thousands of protests, uh, appeals, uh, interventions. We stayed strong. We gathered together, met regularly uh, with each other and defend judges because they were the main um, um, subject of the repressions of the previous government. A lot of judges in Poland had disciplinary proceedings. So all the civil society gathered together to not only defend the judges, but defend the system. And because of those joint efforts, also before election in October last year, uh, we were able to choose the democratic government, which is now in the process of uh, reversing the destruction of human rights and, and the justice system in Poland. We are still in the progress. Not everything is done because of the complexity of the legislative process, but we are going definitely in the right direction. Thank you very much. It's certainly an impressive and inspiring uh, record that um, you have built, and we really appreciate your, your sharing it with us today. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. And next up, I'll speak with a justice leader from Africa and hear about emerging progress on advancing people-centered justice.
I'm now pleased to introduce Mwenya Kayala Buala, the Permanent Secretary for Legislative Drafting at Zambia's Ministry of Justice. Welcome, Permanent Secretary Buala. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This, this year, Zambia is in the top 10 improvers among the 34 Sub-Saharan African countries in our index. The most significant gains are in civil and criminal justice. I know that the Justice Ministry has made improving access to justice central to its broader strategy to foster good governance and accountability in Zambia. What priority reforms are you pursuing to improve civil and criminal justice in Zambia that we're seeing now show up in our index? Thank you very much um, for your question. Uh, like you have indicated, I think Zambia is back in the Champions League because um, we have a leadership that has been very, very positive in ensuring that uh, we enhance uh, good governance and also enhance the rule of law. And to um, follow up with those commitments that our head of state, His Excellency the President, uh, Mr. Haka Inde Hichilema, has made, there are a number of policy initiatives that have been introduced that we have had to um, adhere to as a ministry Ministry and facilitate uh, legal reform. Key among them has been uh, decentralization. As you know, this is one of the flagship programs of the UPND government. And um, as the Ministry of Justice, the Legal Aid Board, has, uh, which is an institution that deals with the provision of legal aid, has decentralized to all the 10 provinces um, in our country. And so this decentralization is facilitating for paralegal assistance. And it also is providing for assistance of uh, um, people who are uh, apprehended by giving them advice on simple issues such as bail applications or just an explanation of whatever charge that they have against them. And we've also introduced legal aid desks in correctional centers because we believe this will enhance um, access to justice and also it fortifies aspects relating to the rule of law. Aside from that, we've realized that there are numerous challenges that we have in the criminal justice system in terms of coordination. So one of the policies that we've adopted as the Ministry of Justice is to introduce an electronic case flow management system, which will be an integrated system linking all the key just criminal justice sector institutions um, to enhance access to justice, to ensure that we're decongesting the prisons and also ensuring that we're providing um, timely justice, fair justice, and access to all. Another key um, policy that we have adopted as the Ministry of Justice is the alternative dispute resolutions. And one of the key aspects that have actually um, been embarked on is the introduction of uh, uh, an arbitration center within our country. As you know, there are so many uh, countries within the region that have international arbitration centers such as Rwanda. And so we have um, established one. And this is really to try and ease the pressure that is currently on the court systems in terms of adjudication of cases. Aside from that, we have also embarked on review of the laws relating to the criminal justice institutions to deal with aspects such as um, economic and financial crimes. We have created specialized courts to deal with um, aspects relating to corruption, uh, illicit uh, financial flow crimes, and aspects that just deteriorate the development of a country. And so we do have an economic and financial crimes court, which came into existence as a result of uh, amendments or le legislative reforms that were undertaken uh, by the Ministry of Justice for and on behalf of government. And last but not the least, I think we have also made tremendous strides with respect to actualizing the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We realize that uh, children in conflict with the law are children that have suffered over the years because they have not been given the separation that is required in terms of separating them from adult criminals or adult um, um, remandees, as the case may be. And so we have provided a piece of legislation that ensures that children in conflict with the law have specialized shelters in the event that they are convicted, that they have special deviation um, procedures in place that provide, provide them an access route 
from the harsh realities of being kept in um, remand prisons within our country, and also providing for support systems through the social welfare system for our children and, and transforming the ideologies that were there of juveniles and really just recognizing that they're just children who've made a mistake and they should be accorded a second chance. Well, that's certainly a, a broad and impressive uh, agenda that you have undertaken. And I really appreciate the concrete examples that you've shared um, with, with our audience. I wonder if you could um, reflect on what some of the valuable lessons are that Zambia has, has learned as, it, as you all work to advance justice and the rule of law. And what, what would you say to other countries that are facing similar challenges and looking to make this kind of progress? Thank you very much for that question. So with uh, legal reform comes a number of challenges. It's one thing to bring the law into motion and uh, develop very good policies, but it's another issue to implement them. And some of the lessons that we have learned along the way is that um, the need for access to information is very important. Whenever we're introducing it as government, we need to go beyond the government institutions, beyond the structures that we have created, and ensure that people have access to the information of what we're doing, what are their obligations, and what are the rights that arise from the legislative reform that we have undertaken. And so some of the key aspects that we have to put in place is institutional reform. There are certain mandates that are created, and you need to have people take up those roles, and that comes with the need for financial uh, support. We also have infrastructure development. I was just talking about the, the reform uh, with respect to the Children's Code Act that we have, which looks at the welfare of children. We have talked about having safe homes. This talks about, this requires us to then uh, develop uh, infrastructure that will provide that facility for the children. It also looks at capacity building because there are so many things that we have adopted and domesticated as a country which will require people to be trained in in order to properly implement what we seek to achieve as a government. Aside from that, I think communication and sensitization is very important. Being a lawyer myself, it's very easy to look at a piece of legislation and understand what is in it. But when we make these laws, the laws are for the common man on the street. And so I think the step for government is to go out and sensitize and break it down, make it easy so that people know what they're entitled to, they know how you are improving their human rights, and they know what sort of obligations they have as citizens of the country. And so for any other country that is embarking on the legislative reform that we have undertaken in the criminal and civil justice system, communication and sensitization are very key. I think one other issue that we need to realize is that when we develop these laws, when we develop these policies, we need to always have a one government approach because sometimes our huge challenge is com compartmentalization or um, believing that one institution can do things without the assistance of another institution. So there must be a concerted effort in uh, implementing the various policies and the legal reform um, initiatives that we have adopted. And um, we have a familiar um, phrase in our country, in whatever we do with respect to the legislation or the policies, we must always adopt a one government approach. Great. Well, thank you very much, Permanent Secretary Bwalia. Uh, these are really in, instructive uh, ideas about, about the importance of implementation. We really appreciate you sharing them with us. Thank you very much for having me. So impressive, Betsy. It's really, really heartening to see all of the creative ways that our stakeholders are actually um, looking to address these rule of law challenges in their country and all the progress that they're making. Absolutely. And and both speakers, I thought, really underscored for us that rule of law progress is a, a, a really long term effort that yep. you can have transition in government and, and new initiatives, but then that needs to be enacted into law and then those laws need to be implemented. Right. And all of that is a is a whole of society kind of effort. Yep. So it was it was great, too, to see all the comments coming in. I think I think these speakers resonated with our audience. Yeah, I agree. I think people are really craving, you know, constructive, practical solutions to today's challenges. So these speakers were great. Absolutely.
and 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 a helpful reminder that progress is possible. We're yep. going to keep these kinds of conversations uh, going, and um, we hope that our audience will now dig into our data, uh, find where the strengths and weaknesses are, and begin to develop the kinds of reform initiatives we've just heard about um, for their own jurisdictions. And then uh, bring those conversations to our World Justice Forum next June. Which will be held in Poland, our most improved country. Yes, we're really looking forward to that and hope everyone will join us in Warsaw next June. Now for a final word, here's WJP's co-founder, Bill Newcomb. Thank you for joining the launch of our 2024 World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. The rule of law is the seminal issue of our time. This launch coincides with the 15th anniversary of our work to advance the rule of law. Our first index covered just six countries, and now we measure rule of law adherence in 142 countries. Our data informs businesses as well as local rule of law organizations. It inspires scholarship, and it drives government reform. In short, the data is the bedrock of healthy communities of justice, opportunity, and peace. The landscape is challenging, but as you have heard, it includes impressive examples of progress. With your support, we will continue to collect and analyze pertinent data. Let's never forget, where the rule of law ends, tyranny begins. Onward we go.